Hey, it's Mike. Let's talk about Reaper. It's pretty common these days to see people asking questions on the internet about mixing. One thing that I see come up a lot is questions about plugins that may be used to help make your mixing a little bit easier. Plugins like Sonarworks, Slate VSX, and Morphit by Tone Boosters are all used to help overcome problems with a room. What I mean by that is if you're working in an untreated or less than stellar room, it can be difficult to accurately hear the frequencies that you're working with, which can lead to you making poor mix decisions. These plugins and applications are designed to help you mix better by way of giving you a much more consistent mixing environment. A consistent and properly treated mixing environment will help you to hear the frequencies that you need to hear, and more importantly, help you to hear those frequencies accurately. For example, a lack of properly placed bass traps can lead to a false impression of how much low end is truly in a mix. This can lead you to either overcompensate or undercompensate for the amount of bass that should be in the mix. These plugins can be very helpful, particularly if you're on a laptop and you're working on the go. But what if you could not only get it right at the source, but get it right at an affordable price point? While I don't want to negate the usefulness of headphone correction or speaker correction software, I'd like to take a look at affordable DIY acoustic treatment panels like the ones that you see behind me. Now of course you can buy professionally made acoustic treatment panels, but they can cost anywhere from 50 to several hundred US dollars per panel. The room that I work in is about 625 square feet, and it would be extremely expensive to treat these surfaces properly. I'm not sure if you notice, but you can usually hear a good bit of room noise and echo in my speaking mic. That's because I've only treated the rear wall behind my drum set, but my ceilings are 14 feet tall and have no treatment, plus the floor is hardwood. This creates a bit of a reflection problem and makes it near impossible to use a speaking or singing mic without some of those reflections getting into the microphone. I wanted to revisit the design that I made for the panels behind my drum set and make new panels to treat my ceilings. While I don't want the room to be completely dead because I do enjoy the way that it sounds for drums, I would love to be able to eliminate some of the reflections that are hitting my microphone for speaking. And while this episode won't necessarily be geared towards Reaper, having a properly treated room will definitely give you a much better experience in mixing regardless of the DAW that you're using. Let's take a look. The panels that I have on the wall behind my drum set measure about 47 inches tall and about 16 inches wide. The insulation material that we'll be using is Rockwool brand Safe and Sound. A small amount of research on the Rockwool product shows that it has a similar sound absorption coefficient to that of Owens Corning 703. OC 703 is a rigid fiberboard that's commonly found in commercially available acoustic treatment panels. At the time of filming, I was able to purchase a 12-pack of the Rockwool Safe and Sound for about $60 at a local Home Depot. Other than the insulation material, a few other things that you'll need for the build are 1 inch by 3 inch pine boards. I purchased mine in 8 foot increments. Don't be afraid to ask for assistance from an associate at the hardware store. Someone more experienced in carpentry can help you to make the best decision so that you can create your panels with the least amount of wasted materials. For joining the pieces that make up the frame, I like to use an air compressor and a brad nailer. You'll also need wood glue, a miter saw or circular saw, a tape measure, and it's not a bad idea to use a speed square to help ensure that all of your markings are precise. You'll definitely want to use safety glasses to help protect your eyes from splinters and wood dust. I'd also recommend a good pair of work gloves to help protect your hands and fingers while working with the wood. You'll need some breathable fabric to cover your panels. You can choose whatever color or printed design that you'd like. Just be aware that officially licensed printed fabric usually costs exponentially more than plain solid colored fabric. If you have a Joann's Fabric nearby, I recommend shopping there and using their cell phone app for coupons and discounts. We'll also need a staple gun for attaching the fabric. My brad nailer also accepts staples, but I don't have any for it right now, so I used a manual stapler. If you're making a lot of these, I definitely recommend using a pneumatic or an electric stapler. Now that we've got our components, let's get started. The short side of the frame should be cut to 16 and 3 quarters of an inch. I'll use my tape measure and a square to make sure that I've got a precise mark on the wood. I'll be using a miter saw to make my cut, so I want to be sure that my wood is pressed firmly against the back fence. My miter saw doesn't have a laser, so I'll drop the blade down and make sure that it lands exactly where I want before I begin to cut. You'll need two pieces cut to 16 and 3 quarter inches for each panel you plan to build. The long sides will be cut to 47 inches. Our insulation panels measure 15 and a quarter inches by 47 inches. When I'm building my panels, I like to cut all of my wood first before I begin joining the pieces. There's an old carpenter saying to measure twice and cut once. You may have some rough edges where you made your cuts. To eliminate the rough edges, use a palm sander or loose sandpaper. If you're using an electric sander, it's very important to make sure that your dust catcher is firmly attached. As mentioned before, each panel will consist of two 47 inch 1x3s and two 16 and 3 quarter 1x3s. I'll lay my pieces out on the bench for my first build and arrange them in a rectangle. 
This is in an effort to dry fit the parts and make sure that everything matches up okay. With the dry fit in place, next we'll lift up the pieces and coat the ends with wood glue. While we will be using brad nails to hold the pieces together, the wood glue forms a very tight bond that's much stronger than the nails. Some people like to use screws to put their panels together, but I find it's much simpler just to use brad nails and glue. If you're using a pneumatic nail gun, be sure to follow the manufacturer's recommendations for oiling. Also, be sure to wear your safety glasses. I'll now put two brad nails on either side of my short panel to secure it to the long sides. You don't have to be very precise in your placement of the brad nails, but be sure that you're not very close to the edge. You definitely don't want to risk going through your fingers. With the first edge secured, I'll move to the opposite end and repeat the process for gluing. If you notice any of your pieces wobbling, flip the pieces to make sure that you have the flattest edge on your work surface. This will help to ensure that your frames are square. Now that I've got my piece flipped and in place, I'll repeat the process to secure the short side to the long sides. Next, we'll need our fabric. Roll out the fabric over your frame and ensure that you've got enough excess so that the fabric can wrap around the edges and overlap to the inside. Once you've got that measurement made, cut off the excess so you've got just enough fabric to work with for this one panel. Now I'll trim the excess fabric and remove my frame so I can spread out the fabric on my work surface. Lay the frame on top of the fabric and begin to move the fabric to ensure that you have enough excess to wrap around the frame on all sides. Now I'll need my staple gun. I typically like to start with one of the long sides. Pull the fabric and wrap it around the edge to reach the inside of the frame. Hopefully you have enough excess to where you've got plenty left over to wrap around on the opposite side. I typically cut the fabric on the inside corner to make sure that it folds over without interfering with the opposite side. Once that's done, I'll place a staple to hold the fabric in place and begin to pull the fabric tight as I go down the frame, stapling as I go. At this stage, since we only have one side secure, it's perfectly normal to see wrinkles in the fabric. You may find that you have way too much excess on the opposite side. If you do, it's okay to trim off the excess or you can leave it. It's totally up to you. I'll pull the fabric tight and begin stapling down this side as well. You'll still have some wrinkles at this point, but you should begin to notice the fabric starting to tighten up. With the long sides complete, we'll move on to the short sides. As with the other sides, be sure to pull the fabric tight as you work down the edge and staple as you go. Now that I'm on my last side, I'll do my same cuts in the corners and begin to pull the fabric even tighter, stapling as I go. With the first frame completed, now it's time to add the insulation panel. Rock wool doesn't tend to irritate the skin like fiberglass, but I still like to wear gloves when working with it. It also doesn't break off into small fibers easily, but you may still choose to use a face mask or respirator while working with it. If you're concerned about the rock wool fibers passing through the fabric, you can use a layer of window screen to help prevent that from happening. With all the panels that I've built, I've not had any issues with fibers passing through them. I'll carefully lay the insulator inside of the frame and begin to press it into place. These insulators are three inches thick, so with a little bit of compression, it should sit flush with the outer edge. Our first panel is complete, and now it's time to build the rest. I typically hang mine by using a laser level to mark a line on my wall, and then place drywall anchors along my line using retractable screws to hang the panels. You may wish to use rubber bumpers at the corners to help protect your wall, or you can use eye hooks and chains if you plan to do the traditional cloud setup. As you can see, these bills aren't very difficult at all to make. And once you get the hang of it, you can easily make a panel in 15 minutes or less. And though it may be time consuming, it's definitely worth the effort and is much more cost effective than buying pre-made panels. I hope this helps. If you like the content you're seeing, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And you can support the channel further by clicking the buy me a coffee, I like coffee, or Patreon link in the description, or use the super thanks option right below the video. Don't forget to check out my drum editing and reaper course on ProMix Academy, and also see the link in the description to join us on Discord. We'll see you next time. Oh, should probably take this off before I start filming.
looks silly. 